How's everybody doing today? The sun's shining. It's nice out. I actually turned my air condition on in my car coming from Keysville, so I couldn't believe it. But uh, I don't know what, you know, it might be snowing tomorrow for all I know. So it's been that way lately. But um, I do have the record button on, so uh, I've um, passed out info over here. The um, Daniel campus, y'all have got um, PowerPoints up front there, so uh, make sure you get those passed out. And if somebody will send around a piece of paper in Keysville so I can have a record of who's there, I sure would appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so just a, a heads up, this is the last chapter before the next test. Okay, it's test time again, believe it or not. Um, so um, there's a lot poured into this chapter. This uh, chapter is on leadership, and I'm telling you there is so much out there in the leadership field now. Um, I mean, people spend, they get their entire graduate degrees just in leadership. There's a lot of um, new theories out there, but there's a lot of history behind leadership as well. So. Um, you're going to find a lot of theoretical things in these chapters. Um, I want you to approach the chapter as not only looking at the theories and so on, but to try to start defining your own leadership style. Because if you're going to become a manager, you're going to need to do a little bit of self-discovery um, and take a look at your style of leadership so that you will be able to best implement your managerial um, skills as you go out in the world to become manager. So just like um, on Tuesday, we talked about different communication styles and some, some of us might be at one end of the spectrum and others might be at the other. There's no right or wrong, okay? No right or wrong. But there have been um, some cases where they have looked at past theories about leadership and determined that maybe they're not necessarily uh, still apply it today, okay? Because uh, if any of you, and you all are such youngsters, maybe you've never worked in a, a factory setting or manufacturing business, you might uh, talk to someone who did and discover that managers in those types of settings in the past, traditionally be, uh, uh, tended to be very, very authoritative and bureaucratic. They were, uh, you know, you do what I tell you to do. I'm not going to bother to tell you why to do it. Um, you better listen to what I'm saying, that kind of thing, okay? Uh, what I say, do what I say and do it now is basically the, the theory of the past. But we've seen more and more of movement towards uh, – incorporating people and their feelings into uh, leadership in businesses as well. And uh, that seems to actually produce better results than it does to just tell somebody they have to do something. Um, remember the situation we did? I told you guys you had to get up and move to the other side of the room. Would have worked a lot better if I had maybe explained why, I've been a little bit more sensitive to your feelings up front. So um, hopefully you can discover some things about yourself as you go through the rest of this class and what type of leader you might be. Um, some people might actually have split styles. They may behave one way in the business setting and another way in their home life. So. Uh, you might see some of that coming out as well. But I want you to, to, just for this moment, think about someone you would identify as being a great leader. Okay, And it doesn't have to be somebody famous. I mean, you all don't have to uh, pick the latest you know, person out there that uh, 
has a multi-million dollar business or anything like that, although that's certainly some examples of good leaders out there. Uh, it doesn't have to be somebody who's still alive. There are plenty of good leaders in our history as well. Um, but I want you to kind of put that person in your mind. Might even be somebody personal that you know. Maybe you think of um, your father as being a great leader. Okay. Uh, it could be maybe one of your teachers or, you know, all kinds of examples out there. Or it could be perhaps somebody who's in politics. Got a lot of people trying to be leaders coming up in this next election. So uh, think about what makes them good leaders and what makes them not so good. And I want you to think about some of the characteristics that you think a good leader has. Okay. Um, if a teacher is a leader in the classroom, what characteristics does that teacher have that makes you think they are either good or bad? Okay. Or if you're choosing your father, for instance, again, what kind of characteristics does your father have that would make you pull that person out as being a leader, a good leader for you? Okay. There are even people who might be good leaders. Now remember, leadership is getting other people to do what needs to be done, okay, what you want them to do. There are some people out there who have been good leaders who are not necessarily good people, okay? Hitler. Hitler is certainly one of those people that I would not say is a good person or was a good person. However, Hitler demonstrated tremendous leadership skills because he was able to convince lots and lots of people to do what he wanted to have done. Okay? So, might surprise you there that there are some good leaders who are not good people. Okay? So before we get started, anybody got any person that jumps in your mind as being a, a good leader that you'd like to share with us, or maybe some of the characteristics that you find of good leaders? Nobody has a leader? Oh, okay. All right, tell us what kind of characteristics might that person have that might make it stand out as a good leader for you. All right, care for other people, certainly up there for you, okay. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and take a look at the PowerPoint slides because we do have a number of theories we need to uh, look through. And um, there is one slide, y'all remind me, there's one slide that I have corrected. It had some errors on it. But I did not, uh, I had already printed them out when I caught them. And I'm going to show you the corrected slides. So you need to make sure you correct yours. Um, these are slides that come from the publisher. And apparently somebody uh, did not do such a good job proofing those. So let me see here. All right, so let me get back here. And hopefully, hopefully, uh oh, we got nothing here. So let me stop that and try again. <laughs> okay, we've got PowerPoints here. Hopefully, I see them in Christiana on the screen back there, so hopefully everybody else has got them as well. Um, <clears throat> remember, leadership falls under the influencing um, category of functions of management that we have uh, talked about already starting uh, last week, or Tuesday, excuse me, last week was spring break. I don't even remember it being spring break. So we're going to define leadership. We're going to talk about, again, some of those theories that were around historically and then some more recent approaches, um, some insights on how leaders should make decisions and how they can actually change an organization. 
how they should coach, um, and some new emerging concepts, because this is a uh, field that continues to develop over time. So I think I already kind of gave you a hint as towards the, the definition of leadership. It's directing the behaviors of others to get them to ac help you accomplish, accomplish an objective. Now directing is a causing an individual to act in a certain way. Okay, so the, again, directing is really tied into the, into the leadership uh, concept. But the thing is that as a manager, as a leader and a manager, you're trying to get things accomplished through other people, okay? Remember we talked about the delegating thing. You don't want to get to the point where you have to do everything yourself in order to get the job done, so you need to lead others as well. Okay, this next slide is the one that had some mistakes on it. If you look at your slide, you'll notice that both sides are identical. The words were the same. So I have corrected the management side of this slide, and you all will need to do so on your uh, PowerPoint. This is the fifth slide, I believe. Um, so probably the middle of the second page there. This slide takes a look at the differences between leadership and management. Okay, they may sound very much like the same thing, but in actuality, they are not the same thing. And all of this is coming out, if you're having a hard time um, picking up the differences there, for some reason on the slide, it's on page 291, all in the wording there in the um, leader versus manager paragraphs that are there, but leadership is a subset of management. Management is much broader. Management excuse me, encompasses leadership skills, but a lot of other skills as well. Leadership looks at behavioral issues primarily, whereas management includes uh, not only the behavioral issues, but also non-behavioral issues. Okay. Leadership cares about and focuses on people doing the job, whereas management's main concern is that the job gets done. Okay. And leadership has that concern for workers as people, whereas management's focus is mainly on the processes in the organization. Okay, so again, that slide, um, for some reason, they had the same things over under management that they did under um, leadership. So you will need to, to correct that, hopefully. Uh, that makes a little more sense because the whole point of this slide is to tell you that leadership and management are different things, okay? Not all managers are leaders, okay? Um, if you look at the next little slide, you will see how they have uh, shown that overlap there are managers who are also leaders but not all managers are leaders and not all leaders are managers okay so we have just a, a little group where it overlaps there where some managers are leaders and leaders are managers but um, not all okay uh, go both ways there so hopefully you've got that slide corrected I did post the the corrected um, slide on the on Blackboard under the PowerPoint. So if you go back to Blackboard, if you need to pull up that information because you didn't get it uh, copied right away or something, you should be able to find it there. Okay, early on, back in the day, way back even before my time, okay? Um, the approach to leadership was to look at certain characteristics 
that people had, and they pulled out certain ones that they believed to be characteristics of people who would make good leaders. Okay, if you possess those characteristics, you would be a good leader. In other words, you were kind of born with those uh, personality characteristics. Uh, you couldn't turn into a leader later on. You couldn't be taught how to be a leader. Okay? Uh, there was, however, a lot of differences based on what those characteristics ought to be. Nobody could come up with any one set of characteristics that would qualify somebody as a leader. So there was some inconsistency. Now the next slide shows some of the traits that they did come up with, and you might have actually identified some of these as being uh, characteristics of people that you consider to be a good leader, intelligent, okay? They've had past achievement and scholarship and athletics. They, just, they exhibit emotional maturity and stability, dependability, persistence, drive. They have social and adaptive skills and a desire for status and socioeconomic position, okay? Not all of them are always on everybody's list, okay? And not all of them guaranteed that people would be good leaders if they possessed those characteristics. I've known some highly intelligent people who couldn't, I don't know, they couldn't direct somebody or lead somebody uh, out of a wet paper bag. I mean, it's just that, you know, that characteristic does not guarantee that you will be a good leader. Now, that doesn't say there are not good leaders who are highly intelligent, because there are, okay? But those early approaches um, tended to rely on that. So if they were looking for, for instance, a president of a company, they would look for somebody who matched up with those characteristics. But that did not guarantee those people would be good leaders. All right, so we move on to um, some changes away from that. There were people who said, you know, leaders don't have to be born that way with these certain characteristics. People can actually be taught to be good leaders, okay? So the behavioral approach came up next, and that was an approach where uh, rather than looking at characteristics, we looked at what good leaders actually do, okay? What they actually do. A couple of important studies there, the Ohio State University study and the University of Michigan study. Got a little bit of information about those. The Ohio State University study has said that there were two different, um, that leaders have two main types of behavior, structure behavior and consideration behavior, okay? So again, they're looking at what types of behaviors these leaders have, not um, characteristics, okay? So structure behavior is where a leader can establish a well-defined procedure that followers will adhere to when they're doing their job, and consideration behavior is the relationship side of things, okay? Developing and maintaining a good relationship between a leader and a follower, okay? Uh, got that friendship, respect, trust, warmth, and so on in there. So good leaders have both of these types. Now, let's look at this little uh, matrix that they have of those two types of behaviors. The, the structure is down here. On the, on the bottom, the x-axis, if you're kind of looking at that as a graph, and the consideration is sort of on the y-axis. And from doing that, you will see four fundamental leadership styles emerge. And there are some leaders are, who are both low in both structure and consideration, and there are some of the opposite that are both high in structure and consideration, and then you have the two that are low in one area and high in the other. 
Um, so this particular study, you know, contributed a lot to our understanding of leadership. Um, the, let's see, as part of this, I believe, was the Lohr International Institute, where uh, they determined that leaders need to demonstrate trustworthiness, honesty, and ability to collaborate. And your followers will say that their trustworthiness is ruined when a leader becomes a credit hog, a lone ranger, an egomaniac, and a mule. Any idea what those terms might mean? I think a credit hog um, pretty much explains itself. That's the kind of leader that takes credit for everything, even though they're not the ones that do it. If you've ever had that happen to you, it will burn you to the core. Okay, I can remember the very first real job I had where I wrote a huge report, turned it into my boss, took the white out to it, but took my name off and put his name on it. Okay. You talk about aggravated, especially when I realized how much more money that person made than I did. So, gee whiz, okay. All right, a lone ranger. Hmm, what do you think a lone ranger is? Do any of y'all young enough to watch the lone ranger on TV? Nobody knew who he was, but he would swoop in and save the world or whatever, right? I just remember Tonto and the, what was the horse's name? Silver. Silver, that's right, that's right. Um, but supposedly nobody knew he was because he wore a mask, right? right? So perhaps if a, a leader is a lone ranger, then people don't uh, trust them quite as much. Maybe they don't even know who he is. What's an egomaniac? You know any egomaniacs? Not necessarily in your business. What what's it, what do you think of when you hear the term egomaniac? Hmm? Big head, okay. In other words, uh, they think well of themselves, right? Okay. So your trustworthiness is ruined when the leader behaves where they are, are uh, almost better than everybody else, right? What's a mule? Yes. Yeah. Think in light, what does a mule do? A real mule, the animal. Hmm? Carries things, works hard when nobody else wants to, right? Uh, works late hours and that kind of thing. I would say that uh, if you have a leader who is a mule, that they are constantly working and uh, sometimes making busy work for others to do. So uh, that destroys trustworthiness as well. Now the other type of, uh, the other studies that were done under the behavioral approaches were the Michigan studies. Uh, Michigan study said there are two types of behavior as well, but they call them job-centered and employee-centered. Okay, the leaders who are job-centered are focusing on the work and how well the subordinates do in the work, whereas the leader that's employee-centered uh, focuses on the subordinates, okay, the people, the personal needs, okay, so you're kind of either a work-oriented or people-oriented kind of person under the Michigan studies. So sort of the same type of thing as the Ohio study was doing. Both of them point to two different types of characteristics, one that's a work dimension and the other that is a people type dimension uh, involved. So we've moved away from the trait definition of a leader to more of a behavioral definition. Okay, 
Research shows that desirable leadership behavior is associated with strong leader emphasis on both the structure and the consideration. Undesirable if the emphasis is, um, the weak leader emphasis is on um, the other, let's see. That doesn't make sense, does it? Desirable leadership behavior associated with strong leader emphasis on both structure and consideration. Undesirable leadership behavior is associated with weak leader emphasis on both dimensions. That sounds like they're saying the same thing to me. So, <coughs> oh, it's the, what they're saying in that second statement is that if, uh, if the leader is weak in emphasizing both dimensions, then that becomes undesirable. That wording is a little yucky there. All right, again, even though there's different approaches and there are certain styles, behavioral styles that can be uh, identified here, Notice that saying one style is better than the other is really not a good thing. That's an oversimplification. Situations have a lot to do with your leadership style. You may behave in one way in one situation, but totally different in another situation. So you as a leader would need to link your leadership styles to appropriate situations. Okay, and that is actually a um, a, a important recent approach called situational approach. Okay, that's again where um, how you behave as a leader depends upon the situation. We also have life cycle theory, Fiedler's contingency theory, and path goal theory. We've got some slides on each one of those. Situational approach says that. Each instance of leadership is different, okay? Uh, because how you function as a leader depends upon the leader himself, the follower, and the situation. They put that S in there for situation, okay? So if I am, say, a teacher, and I'm trying to lead the class in a discussion, I would behave differently than I would be as a leader trying to correct someone for cheating in class. Two different situations. My behavior might be completely different. Okay, the life cycle theory of leadership says that um, your leadership style reflects upon the maturity level of your followers. How you lead depends on how mature your followers are. And maturity here is referring to um, how they are able to perform their jobs, take on additional responsibilities, what their desire is to achieve success. So if your followers have more of those characteristics, uh, then they are said to be more mature. The maturity level will determine the manager's leadership style. Okay, and I am sure um, you are well aware that teaching certainly has something uh, to say about maturity level. The way my daughter teaches in middle school is completely different than the way I would teach a college level class. And that have lot, has a lot to do with the maturity level of the students that are in the class. And by far, she has the harder job, I will say. Okay? Because if you want to see immature people, take a trip to the middle school. Um, some of it is not, some of it's mine, but physiologically, these people are just not mature. Okay? Um, so there's hormones raging and all kinds of things going on in uh, middle school, and therefore she has to teach differently than I would. 
This is the life cycle theory shown as a little model here. Um, kind of low, low task and relationship. Uh, going up here where we have um, high relationship and either low task or, or high task and then dropping off where we are um, high task and low relationship. So um, depends upon your follower. Though. Fiedler's contingency theory um, says, okay, let's not say the leader has to change to fit the situation. Let's say the situation has to change to fit the leader. Okay. So we'll look at the leader member relations, the task structure, the position of power. Okay, and this one shows a, a combination, eight combinations of three different factors that we just mentioned there, the leader member relations, the task structure, and the leader position power. Um, I'll show you the next slide so you can see what they're talking about, these eight, eight octants here. Okay, um, it almost looks like a Rubik's Cube there where there's eight different places you could fall. Okay, uh, dealing with uh, leader member relations being either good or poor, the task structure being structured or unstructured, and the power being either strong or weak. And then the path goal theory of leadership says that the leader is going to outline the goals for the follower and then get out of the way and let the followers take whatever path that they want to get the job done. The followers will achieve the goals and they'll earn rewards contingent on receiving those goals. All right, so there's a lot of managerial skills still involved, though, because the manager has to show how the employees will be rewarded um, when they do receive their desired results. So that's a, that's a really different approach to things there. Path goal theory. Suppose I walked in the first day and said, okay, this class is called Principles of Management. I want y'all to learn the principles of management. That's our goal. Okay. Well, I'm not going to help you get there. you got to figure out your own way. Okay. You might say, well, that's not being very much of a leader. But there might be one person in here that says, okay, I can do that. Give me a book. Give me, a, give me some, you know, websites I can go to. I'll figure it out on my own. But I gotta know what I need to do to get an A still. Okay, I gotta show them what their um, performance is going to get them. I hate to say it, but I kind of feel like online classes are like that. Any of you taken any online classes? You know the material is given to you, but there's not a lot of leadership going on from the instructor. At least that's the way I feel about it, but I'm a little bit old school. We've got some students, all they want to take is online classes. Okay. Um, personally, it, it, it doesn't <coughs> satisfy me as an instructor because I can't have continuous feedback from the class. I can't know what you're understanding and what you're not understanding, even though, like this class, I have to say, you guys are probably the quietest class I have ever, ever had. You're not saying anything, but your facial cues tell me so much. Okay, I can tell whether you're getting it or you're not getting it, or whether you're rather just leave and go home and go to sleep or whatever. But I still get that feedback from you. Okay, whereas on an online class, it's tough. It's tough. But some people love it. That's the way they want to operate. All right. So path goal theory uh, can be directive where you actually tell the followers what to do and how to do or just support it. 
saying, okay, here's this online class. I'll be nice and friendly. Call me if you need me, but you just got to get it done. Okay. We can have participative behavior. Um, again, putting it back into the business setting rather than the, the education setting. It's where your followers will give suggestions to the leader, um, and therefore they are very, very involved in the decision-making process. And then achievement behavior just sets really challenging goals for the followers to reach and making sure you're patting them on the back frequently to say, um, you can do it, you can do it, okay? All right, so there are some of the um, recent theories out there, way different. And it's an evolving subject, okay? Lots and lots of readers, lots of uh, research going on in the field of leadership. But people are still trying to study leaders. Those that you thought of as being a good leader, they're still going back and looking at those people and trying to analyze how they make decisions. Okay? The Tenenbaum and Schmidt Leadership Continuum, very, very quoted articles about how managers, how leaders make decisions. Um, and again, it blends in that situational leadership. Managers are successful decision makers only if the method they use to make decisions appropriately reflects all three of those things, the leader, the follower, and the situation, okay? So here's our um, continuum. You can see that um, all the way from the boss-centered leadership to the subordinate-centered leadership, the boss-centered leadership uses a lot of authority. They make the decision, they announce it. That's the most authoritative method. But that moves on up to just selling the decision to the followers. Or even less authoritative, presenting the ideas and, and letting the followers ask questions. Okay, we go all the way to the other end where there's much, much more freedom for the subordinate. At the very tail end, you see the manager permits the subordinates to function within certain limits if they are defined. So kind of free reign, but there are some limits. Okay. Um, just kind of do it. All right, so what influences a manager's decision making? Um, of course, the manager themselves have, have values, confidence, they have strengths. How much can they tolerate ambiguity? Uh, in the subordinate, are they very independent, ready? Uh, do they have interest? experience, knowledge, certain expectations, and then the situation itself, the type of organization, group effectiveness, what's the problem to solve, and how much time is available. Time plays a really important factor as to how uh, critical it is to become authoritative in a situation. Okay, here we go with another model. Uh, Vroom, Yetin, and I'm thinking that's Yago, but um, it may be Jago. I have no idea. Okay, model. And that one looks specifically at the participation level of your followers in the decision making process. How much do you, as a manager, let your subordinates participate in the decision making? You know your decisions should be high quality, um, but your, dis your subordinates also need to be able to accept and be committed to those decisions that are made. It's not going to work if that's not going to take place. So again, we have um, a little model set up, different uh, decision styles here. Um, 
This is also at the bottom of page um, 302, if you're looking at it there. The A stands for being autocratic, the C for consultative, and G as a group decision. So A1 here is where very autocratic, the, this, the manager is the one that makes the decision, doesn't consult anybody. Okay. A2, the manager gets some information, but they're the one that makes the decision. It's like your boss coming in to you and saying, what do you think about this? And you tell them, and they say, oh, well, we're going to do that. Okay. Um, C1, they're consulting with the subordinates and asking for information. They, there's no group meetings or anything like that. Manager is still the one making the decision alone. You go all the way up to the G2, where the manager and the subordinates actually get together as a group and make the decision. Might want to think about your bosses if you're working somewhere. Is your boss more of a, a C1, C2, or uh, are they more of a group type decision maker? Um, I'm thinking of my boss who uh, usually does consult us in decision making, but sometimes my boss, after the consultation, makes her own decision. Sometimes she brings us together as a group, though, and we get to discuss it. So, I, you know, I feel like she's pretty good about being able to draw the line as to when she needs to make a decision or when um, she needs to step back and let us. I give you an example. I have three people in the um, college that are full-time business faculty, and when it comes to time for putting a schedule together, sometimes it looks like we all want to offer the same class. Okay, and there's just not enough students to go around for all of us to offer the same class. They're not going to pay us to have classes that have one or two people in them. So she'll say, okay, somebody's got to give up this class, okay? And you all, sometimes she'll say, you all decide, get together as a group and figure it out. If that doesn't work, she'll say, all right, I'm gonna pull, make the decision myself, okay? So sort of situational depending on the, on how far we've gotten uh, in ironing things out. All right, so we do have some um, evidence shown by research that um, we have some consistency, uh, the things that follow that model, but it is kind of a complex one. I didn't even begin to, to go through that with you all. I thought that was uh, extremely complex if you look at it. All that little um, spider web, it almost looks like there, of uh, the different types of um, problems that are encountered and whether they become uh, C's or G's or whatever. So that complexity and difficulty is, is certainly something that has held people back from using that. We also have a field that's getting a lot of research called transformational leadership. All right. Transformation is when you are changing something, you're transforming it from one thing to another. <clears throat> and that um, involves trying to inspire your organization by affecting your followers' beliefs. Very close to charismatic and inspirational leadership. Okay. This is how those um, charismatic people try to get you to do something. Okay, and we've had, um, in my lifetime, a couple of charismatic folks that were not such good folks, but they sure were able to inspire people to drink the Kool-Aid. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say drink the Kool-Aid? Okay, that's the case where we had um, sort of a cult-type situation with a leader that was very charismatic and... Um, he was able to convince them to all drink the Kool-Aid, which was poison, and kill themselves. Okay? 
So um, that's what charisma is all about. Not a bad thing. Charismatic people have lots of followers. Okay. Um, it's just whatever their goal is, it might be uh, a problem there. People thought that um, John F. Kennedy was very charismatic. Um, we all are very young and Kennedy got killed in office, but I can remember when he was in office, um, I was a youngster, but my mother, oh, she just thought he walked on water. You know, he was the youngest president and really good looking and his wife was out there uh, strutting her stuff and you know, they were setting the scene for a lot of things. Very charismatic people, okay? Didn't have any problem at all getting followers. Okay? We have a situation now with a president that has a problem getting some followers. They have to, he has some very um, strong followers, but he has others that are really ready to just uh, almost commit some violent crimes to um, him. So, you know, charisma may not be his uh, best tactic there. So this transformational leadership kind of builds on that charisma and they, um, what you're doing is you create a vision that people buy into, you build commitment and then that will help ease any kind of change that's taking place. Here are some of another type of theories dealing with coaching. Leaders coaching others. Okay? A coach. Think about sports game. What's a good coach do? Any of y'all ever played sports? What, what did a good coach do? Teach. Teach. All right, so told you what to do. Probably inspired you a little bit too, right? Okay, so not just the game, but teach you other stuff too. Right, that's right. Okay, um, anybody had a coach here at the college? Because we do have some coaches uh, set up for certain um, groups of people. Coaching is a new, a new concept, okay? Not in sports, obviously, but in an organization. I know I have a, a situation now. We have a, a instructor who came in and is just teaching a, a class here or there, but he came in on a specific program through our Virginia Community College system, and I am that person's mentor or coach. I actually visit his classes and give him suggestions on what he can do to be more effective. Um, I hold his hand when he's learning things like how to use Blackboard or that kind of stuff, you know, just the, how to enter grades into our SIS system and so on. So I'm, I'm teaching, but I'm also trying to inspire at the same time, very much like the coaching that you talked about. All right, so we come all the way back to that difference between a leader and a manager again, the slide that was messed up a little bit. Uh, the leader is going to focus more on the soul, where the manager focuses more on the mind. Okay, remember you can be both, though. You can be a manager and a leader. That's where we're looking for the overlap. The leader is more visionary, passionate, imaginative. The manager is more problem-solving, analytical, authoritative. Okay. How about this one? I know some people who identify themselves as being servant leaders. Servant leaders are people whose role is to help someone else satisfy their personal needs, aspirations, and interests. And I dare say that most of the instructors that you have are servant leaders because what they are trying to do is to help 
the students achieve whatever their goals are, be it just to get through a class or to get a degree or to get a job at a certain place or whatever. The high value is placed on the service that's being provided rather than self-interest. Good listeners, persuasive, aware of their surroundings, empathetic. They are stewards to whatever their followers need. So servant leadership is um, out there in a lot of different places. Level five leadership. This blends in the, um, the personal humility with intense will to look at the long range organizational success. And you see a level five manager identified here as being an executive. Kind of hard to read that on the board for sure. And I'm sure the PowerPoint's even worse. But uh, executives become level five managers because they have focused on the long range success of the organization and they have personal humility. It, look at the level ones on the opposite end of Level one are highly capable individuals. They make productive contributions, but they're not the ones that are going for the great, okay? The greatness that's involved. All right, authentic leaders. Those are leaders who are aware of moral perspectives, not only their own, but also others. They are confident, optimistic, hopeful. They have high moral character. And they have what we call moral courage, the strength to take actions consistent with your moral beliefs. Not only do you believe it, you, you act on it. Okay? All right. So we're going to go and take a look at the... Um, the one video that I have here, I'll, again, remember, I'm trying to help you identify what type of leader you are. This. This. Go back and share my... So focus on this one on what is your leadership style. Now you, again, there is no right or no wrong, but think about yourself as you are looking at this. First thought is the authority. Hold on one second. The authority is really good at setting the vision, painting a clean picture of where we're going. The authority leader will not tell you how to get there, but will be inspiring you to follow. So he or she will say, Come with me, forget where we're going. The next start is the coaching start. When we coach someone, we don't tell them what to do, but we help people to find their own answers. The coaching style is really good to help the individual to unlock their potential. One of the questions that we may ask a coaching staff is, what are you trying to achieve? How might you get there? What are the first steps you want to take? The first style is the democratic style. You probably all understand what the word democratic means. It means that we share the problem space. So in that sense, the democratic leader will almost take a step back and demand their leadership role. They will ask people what they feel is the right thing to do. But it has been proven that decision making by consensus is not the most effective way of finding a good decision. So bear that in mind. The fourth style is the affinity style. This style is all about harmony, a very heart based style. People come first. You might say, well, when is that ever a good idea? But actually, if you're working with a team, then things get unsettled. 
maybe because the two organizations have merged or something else happened. In that case, people may not be ready to focus on the job because they have too much of their emotional health away. In that case, the feelings of style is really The fifth style is the pace of style. It's a pace setup. I set the standard. I roll up my sleeves and I show how the job is done. So I'm not afraid of getting in there and really working with my team to show them how it must be done. In the long run, that can be quite an exhausting style because I'm here as the leader. I do it and I expect them to follow. And it doesn't leave, leave a lot of room. It doesn't leave a lot of room for the individual to actually fill in the blank. The last style is the commanding style. This is the old fashioned command and control management style where it is my way or no way to do as I tell you. This style, as you could probably imagine, is not very effective in the long run because it doesn't need a lot of room for the individual to perform well and it's not very empowering. But there is a time and a place where it is appropriate. For instance, in a crisis situation, the building is burning, I give you direction get out. But we shouldn't abuse the style because we think there is always a crisis going on. So my question to you now is, which of these six styles do you tend to use most of the time? There is a time and a place for each of them, and it's good to mix them up. But it has been proven that the authoritative style and the coaching style are the most effective in the long run. The authoritative style, you set the vision, you inspire people to follow, and the coaching style, you help them to find the answers for themselves. Thank you for watching. Please visit us again at coachmanager.com. All right, so did, did you see a style that you actually um, thought maybe you tend to lean a little more to? Are you the kind of person that tells people what to do? Are you the kind that helps them find their own way along the road? Or are you bouncing back and forth among the different styles depending upon the situation? Okay. Even if you do that, you probably tend to be closer to one style over others. Okay. So does anybody have any um, thoughts about how you think you might be as a leader, what your style might be? If any of you are parents, you're already in a leadership role. How are you there? Or how are your parents? Did they tell you what to do? Or did they coach you along the way and explain things and help you decide what to do? Or did it depend on the situation? <laughs> Think about that. You all as parents or your parents themselves probably hope that they teach you how to make some of those critical decisions in the future yourself. So hopefully there was some coaching going on. But chances are there were quite a few times where the building was burning and they told you what to do. Okay. But as she said in the video, make sure that the building doesn't just keep burning. Or you think that every single um, Thing that you're approaching is a burning building because they're not all that way. Okay, next week is test week. We will do as our normal um, Tuesdays in Keysville and Thursdays here. So you'll have some um, time to uh, get your stuff together. Same setup as all the other tests have been on the computer. You'll be able to use your uh, books and your notes, um, but you cannot go outside of the test once you start. Everything has to be in paper copy for you there. Okay. Um, again, it covers 
Let's see. I think it was chapter maybe nine. I'm not, let's let's pull up that. Oh, I've closed down my website. Let's let's check it out. Oh no. Make sure we got the right chapters here. Mm -hmm. us. <laughs> this test of chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10, 11, 12, and 13. Okay. So we should have spring break in between there. Hope you didn't lose all your brain cells during that time. And hopefully you're ready to knock out another one. And again, Tuesday, the Keysful people will come in and we'll go to a computer room and take care of the tests with that. The Daniel people do not have to come on Tuesday, but Thursday Keysville will be off and um, Daniel will be on. My Christiana and Emporia people, if you will make arrangements with your um, testing centers, I will send the passwords to them and make sure they're proctoring it for you. Uh, what kind of questions do you have? All righty. I hope the weekend's as wonderful as this afternoon is, and I hope you all enjoy. Um, and I hope you get some studying done, too. Okay? So I'm going to stop the recording and end the meeting. <laughs>